A push nation, what's going on? It's Mr. M. This is a I would what do I want to call this? I want to call this a uh, a note coverage lecture, video lecture. Um, away from home, I am at uh, the mom's place uh, visiting for the night. So I'm surrounded by about a million dogs. So if you hear dog freak out and bark all of a sudden, that's probably because my mom's dogs have decided to freak out. So anyways, uh, if there's uh, a topic that you ought to freak out over, it's probably uh, something crazy like World War I. Uh, so I don't blame those dogs. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, dogs did fight in the war. Uh, but that's a, that's a story for another day. Let's get started here with World War I. Please follow along in the notes. You can, um, uh, they should be in the exact order that I cover them in these slides. All right, so we're going to get right into it with the Great War in Europe. I'm going to go kind of fast here because a lot of these details uh, are not really necessary. You need to know general ideas. Uh, so we all remember from last year how World War I started. It started when a Serbian nationalist, remember from the group The Black Hand, assassinated the Austrian heir to the throne. His name was Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Uh, of course, that led to a series of events uh, that are going to start the war. Uh, remember, uh, Franz Ferdinand again, Austrian, he and his wife, traveling in an open carriage car. They are shot by the man up in the top right of my screen, Evrilo Princip, again, a Serbian who wanted independence uh, for parts of Austria that he believed should belong to Serbia. Uh, and there, of course, is the recreation of the event. Uh, that's pretty, pretty morbid there in the bottom right hand of the screen there. We've got the two that are actually dead, the two dead bodies there when they're lying in state. Um, anyways, dogs, go get away from me. Anyways, what happens, of course, is after the killing of the Archduke, Austria sends ultimatums to Serbia, Austria backed up by Germany, Serbia backed up by Russia. We're going in the wrong order. Uh, eventually, um, Austria declares war on Serbia. And, of course, Germany uh, jumps in. Uh, Russia jumps in and, and defends Serbia, declares war on Austria. Germany declares war on Russia and France because France and Russia are allied. Remember, this was the era when alliances um, entangled everybody into these conflicts. Of course, remember what happens is uh, Germany, uh, during the course of the war, is going to invade France. They go through a neutral country, Belgium. Belgium, of course, had an alliance with Britain. That's going to bring Britain into the war. A year later, Italy joins on the side of the Allies this time around. Remember, it's different in World War II. Remember, this is the, uh, the war where we have the, uh, the bloody trench warfare, the stalemate. No, the lines barely ever move. Mass killing on a scale we've never seen before, ever before in battle. Just wiped out entire male populations. Tens of millions of deaths. Uh, just slaughter on the battlefields, uh, sending men to their death. Uh, of course, the Central Powers, remember the war, the, uh, Europe is divided into two alliances, the Central Powers, uh, Germany, Austria, and Turkey, or the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and then, of course, the Allies, remember, originally they had been called the Triple Entente. Uh, France, Britain, and Russia. Uh, eventually, the U.S., Italy, and Japan joins them, uh, making it a truly world war. Uh, there's a nice map there of the countries. You can see uh, Germany and Austria are depicted in the pink. Uh, those are the central powers, along with Turkey. Um, and then, of course, uh, obviously on both sides, you have uh, France, Britain, and Russia, uh, along with little Serbia, the ones who kind of started it. All right. Uh, remember, there's a Western Front uh, along the border between France and Germany, in which France and Britain fight against Germany. And then there's an Eastern Front where Russia is fighting against Germany and Austria-Hungary. All right. Um, anyways, and then, of course, there's overseas fronts, for instance, in Turkey. Uh, the U.S., meanwhile, maintains neutrality. The U.S., in fact, stays neutral for almost this entire conflict. We only get into it for the last year, so three out of the four years, we are neutral, uh, even though we technically support the Allied side. Uh, we stay out of it. Uh, originally, we were neutral. Wilson uh, basically uh, pledged neutrality, called upon Americans to stay neutral uh, in action and thought, so kind of maintain an open mind and to avoid getting involved directly or trying to uh, you know, get involved in the fight. 
Um, both sides, of course, appealed to the United States. They realized having the U.S. on their side would give them a huge advantage. Of course, the British had many close ties to the United States, dating all the way back to the colonial era. We also had become pretty close allies with them. Uh, of course, the Central Powers also tried to appeal to the fact there were a lot of German immigrants in this country, and Austrian too, but mostly German. Uh, and remember, a lot of the Irish Americans hated England for what England had done to them in Ireland, uh, and so they tended to support uh, the German side or the Central Powers. Even some Jews did as well, uh, because they were angry at Britain over not allowing them to have their own homeland in the Middle East. So again, a number of groups inside the United States uh, supported the German side, even though the majority of the population tended to lean towards the British. And more than anything, regardless of whether you supported Germany or England, you just simply preferred to stay out of it. You fiercely fought for neutrality. You didn't want to get involved. Um, so that's how it's going to go. As the war does drag on, there becomes more anti-German sentiment in the country. Um, but uh, more than anything, like I said, avoid war at all costs. Uh, anyways, uh, the money. <laughs> this is a huge boost for the United States. This is what really, I think, in one way, kind of helps to start turning the U.S. into a major world power. Um, so uh, when the war breaks out, uh, there was actually a bad effect on the economy. We don't really remember that. We remember that there was a huge boost to the United States as a result of war orders by Britain and France. They ordered, for instance, ships and other uh, weapons and ammunition from the U.S. Um, in addition to that, we tried to trade as well with Germany, but Britain established a blockade of all German ports uh, with that powerful navy the British have. Uh, they forced the United States ships into British ports first to trade. Uh, of course, that meant almost all American products went to the British or the Allied side. Eventually, Germany declared submarine warfare against Britain uh, and try said they'd try not to sink neutral ships. Uh, but uh, they said, you know, we can't be certain about it. It is a war zone. Uh, so they declare a war zone around England and they start to uh, use submarine warfare there. Uh, anyways, Wilson uh, did warn Germany, said if you sink our neutral ships, uh, we will, uh, you know, we'll be angry about this and uh, don't do it. Uh, anyways, nice picture of the Kaiser there, right? Down at the bottom right. They have the sweetest helmets, don't they? Uh, and then those are the German U-boats, folks. They're submarines, all right? Uh, this is early submarine technology. They were a new type of weapon. Uh, they were devastating to shipping uh, because, of course, it allows you to be attacked from underwater without really knowing it. Um, but, uh, again, and they attacked in groups oftentimes. That's why they were oftentimes known as wolf packs, uh, because it was like a group of wolves attacking a convoy at once. Uh, the dark blue area shows you the area that Germany declared they would start uh, sinking uh, ships in. Um, in response to the blockade, they wanted Britain to lift the blockade. If Britain lifted the blockade, they'd call off the submarine warfare. Uh, the German subs did sink 90 ships in early 1915, but of course, it all starts to change with this. In May of 1915, uh, the Lusitania, which was a passenger ship, it was a cruise ship essentially, folks, um, was sunk by a German U-boat, 1,200 people killed, 128 Americans. Um, of course, this is devastating. That's a massive loss of life. Uh, I'm not quite sure why a cruise ship was sailing in the middle of a war zone, but I guess they just kind of assumed they wouldn't have to worry about getting sunk because they were a cruise ship. Uh, the reality was, folks, they were, in fact, carrying some small arms ammunition, um, which was one of the reasons Germany justified the attack. Anyways, uh, since so many Americans had been killed, Wilson did warn Germany, uh, however... Uh, and the U.S. does start to prepare for war a little bit. We start to raise taxes for the war, for instance. Um, but, you know, in the same sense, he couldn't, I guess, warn them too harshly because these were Americans who were traveling aboard a British ship in a war zone uh, on a pleasure cruise, essentially. So, in a way, you almost have to be like, what were these Americans thinking? Regardless, um, the uh, it starts to ramp up the, the efforts towards war. William Jennings Bryan, our Secretary of State, resigns. Uh, he was a pacifist. He didn't want to be involved in this. He gets into, you know, Wilson had a famous comment about him. Hey, there's no such thing as being too proud to fight. I think we're starting to see the U.S. at least think or consider war for the first time. 
There was the Lusitania. Looks a lot like the Titanic, if you ask me. Anyways, um, killed. 1260, right? 15 minutes, including some famous Americans like one of the descendants of Cornelius Vanderbilt. Uh, here we go. This is a uh, really effective political cartoon. You see the Kaiser here in the forefront. Uh, you see Uncle Sam there. Um, standing above the dead babies, American babies who are draped in an American flag. Basically, Uncle Sam's got a pose like, hey, look what you did, right? Here's the facts. Here's, here's what happened, and you're responsible for it. Uh, so clearly a magazine that, or a magazine cartoon uh, that wants to see the United States exact some sort of retaliation against Germany or force Germany to apologize, something Germany was unwilling to do. Here's another one. You see uh, the German uh, sailor, I guess, depicted as a buccaneer, a pirate. Um, and you see what is he carrying off while the Lusitania in the background is sinking. As he leaves the scene of the crime, he's carrying off the disrespect of the world. Uh, the title, of course, is Booty, like treasure. Uh, so what is the treasure of the German, according to this cartoon, is the disrespect of the world. That's what they've earned for the Lusitania sinking. Uh, the big issue here, of course, was they sunk a passenger ship. Uh, which was considered, obviously, um, a big no-no, right? Uh, you're supposed to obviously be targeting military vessels that are, in theory, targeting you. All right, here's another. This is a great British propaganda poster. Um, it's, uh, you know, taking up the sword of justice. What do we see? We see uh, dead Americans or dead, dead, I guess I should say passengers um, of the Lusitania as it goes down, people that are drowning, um, and who, uh, who is this? This is somebody that's rising from the dead, I guess you could say, almost like Lady Liberty rising from the dead, um, like a ghostly apparition or a zombie, asking other Americans to take up the sword of justice for this injustice that has happened, the sinking of the Lusitania. Uh, shortly after, actually, another ship, the Arabic, was sunk. Uh, eventually, following these dual sinkings, Germany bowed to a lot of pressure, uh, from the U.S., they agreed not to sink any more unarmed ships. In fact, they signed an agreement to do so. It was called the Sussex Ultima Ultimatum and Pledge. Well, let me rephrase that. They stopped after the Arabic and agreed to no longer sink unarmed ships in the war zone area. Then, in March 1916, Germany torpedoed a French ship, the Sussex, uh, and, uh, again, Wilson threatened Germany with diplomatic action that might lead to war. Germany promised to stop sinking all merchant ships and passenger ships, uh, but only if the U.S. convinced Britain to suspend her blockade. So Germany called off on restricted submarine warfare in 1916. Um, this was about a year after the Lusitania, uh, and it's about a year before the United States actually declares war, so... This was a step uh, in between the both of them. So after the Sussex, uh, Germany agrees they'll stop unrestricted submarine warfare if the U.S. can convince Britain to suspend the blockade of German ports. In the meantime, we have the election of 1916. The Republicans nominated a progressive. His name is Charles Evans Hughes. Um, the Republicans and the Bull Moosers met in Chicago. Roosevelt uh, did not run in 1916 in order to try to avoid splitting the party. Uh, the Republicans uh, nominated uh, Hughes. Um, he was a Supreme Court justice. He was an ex-reformer uh, who had over time embraced old guard conservatism, a lot like um, Taft, I would say, in some ways. Uh, what did he call for? Higher tariff, of course. Less regulation of businesses. Let those babies grow. Let them merge. Let them uh, make deals without taxes and or regulation by the government. Um... He uh, was opposed to Wilson and his handling of Mexico and, of course, uh, was opposed to Wilson's handling of Germany uh, and the threats leading up to World War I. Wilson was renominated. His slogan, he kept us out of the war. What's the implication there, folks? He's going to keep us out of the war more, right? I mean, you don't run on that ticket uh, if you don't kind of promise to do the same. Look at the outcome here. Uh, Wilson narrowly escapes with a victory. Um, now, he does win a huge majority of the states, uh, but some of those huge population centers went to the uh, Republican, went to, which makes sense, and went to the, uh, the industrialist again. 
Uh, anyway, so ultimately, Wilson is your victor in a narrow victory. Shows you why he passed all those reforms, remember, at the end of his, pres- at the end of, uh, his first term. Uh, all of those actions, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, the Siemens Act, uh, for instance, and why, you know, disability insurance, um, those laws that were passed at the end of his first term, he did those to try to show he was a progressive in order to get votes right before the election, and he needed them in order to win. Anyways, right after he wins his re-election, he starts to move the U.S. towards more active entry into the war. He gives a speech, Peace Without Victory, January 1917, says, hey, uh, we have to have a negotiated peace between all parties in order for it to last, which means, hey, we need to try to make sure everybody, even the losers, have a voice in the negotiations. He's trying to set things up uh, for his Treaty of Versailles after the war. He's trying to set things up for the creation of a League of Nations um, that uh, would include all nations of the world. Uh, Eventually, 1917, the U.S. is going to get into this conflict after it's raged and devastated Europe for three years. Uh, Why? Well, because Germany goes back to unrestricted submarine warfare again in 1917. That's why the U.S. ultimately is going to join. Um, so why did Germany make this decision? Well, first off, they said all ships will be sunk in, in the war zone again, including American ships. Why, they said, because uh, Britain had never taken, had never, you know, uh, taken away their embargo, uh, their blockade. So therefore, Germany said we're entitled to go back to, this, to the unrestricted submarine warfare again. Uh, Germany believed the U.S. would probably declare war, but it would be too late to actually affect the outcome. Wilson does break off negotiations. The U.S. begins arming our our merchant ships to prepare themselves to defend against German attacks. We start to see these sorts of political cartoons with the Kaiser uh, leading his wolves that are swearing their loyalty to him with the U-boat paper at the bottom. These are supposed to be the U-boat sailors and or commanders swearing their loyalty like wolves uh, who are about to go and, you know, seek out their prey. In this case, the prey would be innocent American merchant ships. Uh, Anyways, we have another cause as well, much smaller, but you need to be aware of it. Uh, Zimmerman note, in in March of 1917, just a couple of months after unrestricted submarine warfare started again, as American ships are getting sunk, uh, a telegram was uh, intercepted by the British from by Germany to Mexico, and the British intercepted it. They handed it over to the Americans. Uh, what the telegram said was uh, Germany wanted to know if Mexico would consider an alliance and join with them in the war against the United States. Uh, and if, uh, if Mexico agreed, Germany promised to give them back a lot of the land they had lost as a result of the Mexican War. So, um, you know, Germany basically said, hey, Mexico, you interested in working with us against the U.S. uh, and going to war? Uh, If we win, you'll get the lands that you lost from the U.S. in the past. Mexico never really even considered it. Um, They just kind of shrugged it off. Wasn't a big deal to them. Um, But uh, needless to say, the American public freaked out and was outraged by this. They were angry uh, that Germany was plotting with Mexico uh, and then, of course, American ships, four of them, get sunk by German U-boats in March. Wilson, in April 2nd, has had enough. He goes to Congress. He asks for a declaration. Uh, we give it on April 6th. Why? Unrestricted submarine warfare, by far the most important. To a lesser extent, the Zimmerman note or telegram uh, further pushed Americans to action. A big thing here is, remember Russia? When the U.S. joins, Russia had dropped out because they were having their communist revolution. Now that the Russians were gone, it was a little easier for the U.S. to join uh, and not be allied with a dictatorship that had been the case with Russia before under a czar. The U.S. thought it could end the war quickly. We do, probably not as quickly as we had hoped. Uh, and, of course, Germany Germans were starting to be seen as immoral. They were starting to be portrayed as monsters, as brutes. Um, some of it true, most of it not, um, and, uh, and so they were seen as immoral, uh, they were killing civilians, and they needed to be taught a lesson. Uh, there's Wilson actually asking for the declaration of war, uh, he gets it, 
Um, now we get into the war itself. First off, Wilson had to sell the war to the U.S. Remember, he had campaigned on keeping us out of the war and had kind of pledged more of the same during the campaign. Now, almost immediately, he goes back on his word and he gets a declaration. So he's got to get the American public behind the effort. Uh, and he's abandoning about 100 years of, of isolationism, a foreign policy that had been tradition all the way back to Washington. Uh, and so Wilson uh, wants to uh, inspire Americans to join. Uh, and so he tries to appeal to our idealism, the fact that we can kind of help the rest of the world and change the world. And he says, hey, this war is about two things. One, it's about making the world safe for democracy. So it's democracies like the United States and Britain helping other democracies to grow, to exist, to develop, uh, because ultimately we believe democracies are a key to peaceful coexistence around the world. Secondly, he says, we are fighting a war to end all wars. Uh, so not only are we making the world safe for other democracies like ourselves, uh, but we're fighting a war uh, so that we won't have to fight wars in the future. We're going to win this war. We're going to establish things afterwards to prevent wars from breaking out in the future. Uh, so we need to do this in order to save the future from con future conflicts, to avoid future wars, and to start an era of peace. Uh, so those are the two things he sold to the American public. Um, he tried to, con you know, to to make to compare us, or really to contrast us, um, with Europe, where it, you know, so Europe's fighting for selfish reasons. They're fighting for land. They're fighting over disputes in around the rest of the world, and they're fighting over um, areas of land. They've joined these alliances. Uh, meanwhile, we're fighting to make the world a better place, uh, so that we can end conflicts that would that might otherwise develop in the future. Uh, over time, he really persuades the American public to join. Uh, the moral appeals are especially uh, appealing to the U.S., um, and uh, a lot of Americans do end up getting behind the war effort. Um, his 14 points he delivers in January of 1918 as the war is being fought after we had been in it for nearly a year. Um, and what he does is he basically gives a speech to Congress and he says, hey, when we win the war, um, we're going to do these things. And he lists 14 points that he's going to achieve or try to achieve. Uh, we're going to abolish secret treaties. We're going to allow all ships to sail freely on the open ocean. We're going to remove tariffs and other trade barriers. We're going to, you know, we're going to reduce the arms race. We're going to reform colonial he says, hey, we're going to end colonialism around the rest of the world. Now, hey, you need to understand each of these 14 points or provisions or things he wants to do. He believes these are the reasons why almost all wars break out, uh, because there are secret treaties and alliances that push countries into war, uh, because there are disputes on the ocean about ships having access to trade areas and things like that that can push that can lead to, to wars. Um, the tariffs that are passed sometimes lead to trade wars, which lead to real wars. Uh, that we have arms races uh, where we build up our military and then we're more likely to use them. Uh, that colonial fights and disputes lead to a lot of wars. So all of his 14 points were really designed to prevent conflicts in the future. Uh, he promises to give self-determination to groups who currently didn't have it. So people all over Europe, like Poles, like Czechs, like Yugoslavians, like Latvians, like Lithuanians, who were living under other empires, like the Russians or the Germans or the Austrians, uh, suddenly are getting excited of the possibility of having their own homelands, redrawing the maps of Europe after the war is over. Uh, and then the big one, the 14th point, the capstone, the culmination. He wants to create an organization of countries uh, that are going to work together and promise to support one another to preserve peace in the future. It's going to become the League of Nations. Um, it's going to become our first major international organization. Uh, of course, it's going to be doomed by the fact that the U.S. never joins, despite our own president being the one who created it. Anyways, during the war, home front, okay, what do we do to win the effort, uh, to win the war at home? We do a lot. In fact, we focus a lot more on this than the actual action. Uh, first off, we got to win the hearts and minds of the people. We got to get them to support the war. We got to will them, get, them, uh, get them willing to do what they want or do what they need to to help us win. Uh, it's going to be the Creole Committee, uh, also known as the Committee on Public Information or the CPI. Uh, again, sell the war to uh, to the American public, headed by George Creel. Uh, he was a propaganda guy. He was in advertising. He was really great at what he did. Um, you know, he doesn't. 
Um, there was no mandatory censorship. Uh, what he did was he asked the media, he worked with the media to get them to voluntarily censor information that he thought was bad for the war effort. So um, they didn't publish critical, um, you know, articles about the war. Uh, they didn't criticize decisions. Oftentimes they might hide losses uh, or bad things that had happened from the public because they didn't want the public to know about them because they thought the public wouldn't support the war as much. Uh, so they really got the media to do the thing that medias normally do the opposite of during wars. They got them to work with the government instead of maybe exposing some of the wrong things the government was doing. Uh, in addition to that, the CPI established liberty leagues. They're almost like... Um, uh, what do we call those neighborhood watches uh, where the people in the neighborhood uh, would get together and they were encouraged to support the war by while well, spying on their enemies uh, on their neighbors to see if any of them might be german spies or austrian spies uh, to make sure that everybody was doing what they could to support the war effort uh, to always be watching your neighbors especially the german american ones um what else did they do they did a bunch of like propaganda films um a lot of times they would try to whip up enthusiasm and passion for the war or uh, find ways for people to support it. It was all voluntary, so they really just encouraged people to do what they could, and people really embraced it. Uh, there was a lot of efforts to get behind the war once we were in it. Um, uh, the reality of it was they made a lot of promises to get people involved. A lot of these promises were pretty much impossible to achieve once the war was over, so they did get a lot of hopes and expectations up. That they're not able to realize uh, that's one thing propaganda, I guess, can do for you. One of the things they did, this is a great image of two silent movie heroes, Charlie Chaplin and Douglas Fairbanks, uh, whipping up support for the war uh, by kind of goofing around and doing like a show. Um, these guys were called Four Minute Men because they would appear in the kind of four minute propaganda like videos um, at the beginning or at the end of movies. Uh, so, again, just a way to kind of pump the war effort and to show the things the American government wanted the public to see um, before and after movies. Another way to just sell the war. Okay? Awesome images. The spirit of America join an appeal to women, right? Look at that beautiful, um, chast, I guess you would call her, American nurse, right? Doing, doing what she needs to to win the war. Uh, restrictions on civil liberties, yeah, there were a ton of them. A lot of people had their rights infringed on. This happens during times of war. It happened during the Civil War. It happens during this war as well. And, of course, it is bad during World War II. Uh, there was a lot of anti-German hysteria. A lot of it was from propaganda. So the pre committee, the CPI, the Committee on Public Info, had some blame for that. Uh, some really famous examples, the Espionage Act of 1917, uh, you get fined or even jailed if you made false statements that helped the enemy, if you incited rebellion in the military, if you obstructed draft recruitment, uh, for instance, you burned your draft cards or anything like that. Um, in other ways, uh, Wilson uh, wanted to censor uh, the media, but Congress didn't let him, uh, which is, I think, a good thing. In addition, the Sedition Act was passed. Remember, sedition means you're a traitor, all right? So... Uh, the Sedition Act, it, you couldn't criticize the government, the flag, or the uniform, or else you could be fined or jailed. Uh, it allowed a lot more people's mail to be excluded, which meant that the government would monitor your mail uh, and potentially take messages or mail that they thought um, was uh, being used perhaps for, for anti-war activity. Um, socialists and Wobblies, the communists, were targeted. Uh, those were the two parties that were. For instance, Eugene Debs was convicted of espionage because he criticized the war effort. Over 100 Wobblies, including the head of the Wobblies, the International Workers of the World, uh, was jailed. These guys were held throughout much of the war, um, it, even though they're American citizens, uh, based on a conviction for a law that was clearly a violation of their freedom of speech. Um, this was, um, this was a political cartoon, uh, that actually made fun of people who spoke out against the war or who opposed the war. That, 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 that lamb there is supposed to be Jane Addams. She's supposed to represent pacifists because she was a pacifist and those like her. Uh, and do you see what this is, cartoon is saying? By being a pacifist, by not supporting the war effort, she's essentially, 
uh, married to the German Kaiser, who's being depicted, of course, as a wolf that's about ready to eat her, right? So kind of playing on fairy tale uh, while at the same time, I guess playing on a nursery rhyme, I should say, uh, while at the same time uh, depicting pacifists or slamming pacifists for not doing enough uh, to help the war, to for opposing the war, which many Americans considered un-American and almost like uh, treasonous or traitor-like activity. Uh, of course, some people challenged the Espionage Act, um, uh, and it's kind of surprising to a lot of people in a case that really defined freedom of speech for many years. Um, the uh, the courts essentially ruled uh, that uh, that the Espionage Act could be done, that during times of emergency, uh, the government was allowed to restrict freedom of speech uh, if it thought that it needed to, if the freedom of speech led to a threat uh, against the American people. Uh, so if your speech could be interpreted as a threat during a time of emergency, your speech could be restricted. And World War I, the courts argued, was definitely an emergency situation. Uh, so, yep, you could be censored. Your mail could be uh, could be denied uh, if uh, your the government felt like yeah, you were a threat to the country. Uh, anyways, the thing is, is a lot of folks are in prison for years and years, even after the war for years. Uh, and uh, they're not uh, really entitled to their uh, to their constitutional rights. So this is considered a time when civil liberties are ignored. Uh, oftentimes it was the civil liberties of the folks that were most critical of the war or the government. Uh, and so I think a lot of the time maybe it doesn't get the attention that it would, I don't know, if it were harmless families, for instance. Uh, how else do we mobilize for the war? Well, we've got to mobilize the economy as well. So it's not just the hearts and minds of the people. Uh, we've got, and, and you know, and doing that means that you pump up the good stuff with propaganda and you eliminate the bad stuff by quieting the critics. Uh, and now we got to get to mobilizing the factories to produce what we need to win the war. The U.S. wasn't really ready for war when we declared. Uh, and so we give power to a guy over our economy. Uh, we create a board. It's called the War Industries Board. We put a guy named Bernard Baruch in charge of it. Uh, and he really had control over our entire industrial production. Uh, the, really, the problem was he got a hold of it so late that he really wasn't able to convert our economy uh, before the war ended. Uh, but anyways, uh, we give him central control over our economy, which means he could kind of, and his board, could kind of help coordinate what products needed to be made in order to win the war. Uh, they controlled raw materials, which means they said, hey, these materials are going to these places uh, to be built and to be turned into finished products. They controlled production. And so they said, hey, these are the products we're going to build. These are the things that we need to win the war. They controlled prices uh, so they could control, for instance, uh, the price of goods uh, so the prices didn't go too high or too low, uh, which might have influenced the war effort in a negative way. And they controlled labor relations, which means they negotiated deals between the government and industry, between workers and industry to try to avoid strikes. Uh, it never had as much power as you might see, you think, just again, because uh, the war ended too soon and it was dismantled shortly afterwards. However, it is going to be a model we're going to use during the Great Depression and New Deal and during World War II uh, for how we are going to get our economy really going um, in those wars or in those crises. Uh, the government encouraged workers to help the war effort. They uh, really pumped the fact that labor would help win the war. Women were encouraged to join the, in industries, especially to replace men that are fighting. Uh, agriculture as well had a lot of female workers. Um, because of women's efforts, remember, Woodrow Wilson is going to switch over and begin to support women's suffrage. So that's a major effect. Million women from the home to the factory. Uh, however... Uh, after the war, women are really forced back into the home again. Uh, they do not are not able to keep these jobs. Oftentimes, men uh, were given these jobs, and women are forced back in the home once more. All right. So, anyways, of course, the greatest effect for women of the war, the most direct effect, again, Nineteenth Amendment, women's suffrage, about dang time. Uh, African Americans, great migration experienced during the war. That's the movement of African Americans, thousands of African Americans out of the South up to northern cities. Why? Because there was a need for abundant jobs in factories. Uh, and since whites, males were overseas fighting, African Americans were able to take these jobs and get hired. 
Uh, and this leads to massive movement of African Americans to the north in northern cities. Chicago, Detroit, Kansas City, Cleveland, New York, um, Philadelphia. All of them start to have large African American populations that cluster together in the cities themselves. Um, what's the result of this? Well, race riots, not only during but especially after the war. Uh, as uh, whites and African Americans oftentimes fought over job access, in particular um, access to low paying jobs in factories. Mexican workers also replaced American workers, especially in agriculture, but also in some service jobs, uh, particularly in the Southwest. Um, as you can see, uh, in the 1910s, um, we start to see the massive migration of blacks out of the South. Uh, and when that happens, you're going to start to see things like lynchings and other racial murders start to really decrease. All right. There was an unofficial work or fight rule that was established by the government. Um, if you're not fighting, right, if you're not on the front lines and joining in the military to serve, you better be working. Uh, and so uh, there was kind of that rule and pressure on men to support the war effort in some way, if not directly fighting and doing what they could at home on the home front. Um, it wasn't all great for labor. In fact, there was terrible inflation despite the government's efforts during the war. There were over 6,000 strikes during the war. I mean, a lot of them were by the Wobblies, but needless to say, there were 6,000. Um, there was something called the National War Labor Board that had been created by President Taft. Its job was to oversee labor disputes. Um, it wasn't able to... Uh, it, it prohibited strikes, um, but it also uh, tried to allow for progressive reforms. Obviously, there were still a lot of strikes despite it. Uh, the government did recognize unions' right to, to organize, but of course the problem with these guys when it came to strikes, uh, the International Workers of the World, the IWW, there's their famous symbol or, or sign, um, and they're communists. That's what they are. They're the communists. Um, they were trying to undermine the war effort. Remember, they're seeking kind of a violent overthrow of our government and the return of a, uh, and, and turning into a communist government instead. Uh, so they kind of tried to undermine the war effort. They tried to riot a lot of time and strike um, because uh, they were trying to hurt the war effort as much as they could. A lot of them were arrested. A lot of them were beaten up, run out of town. We know a number of them, like we mentioned, were imprisoned for large parts of the war. The war economy, Herbert Hoover and the Food Administration are probably your greatest uh, achievement by the home front. Uh, this is considered the great, uh, I think, achievement in terms of all of these things that are created. Uh, who was he? He was a guy who really had already established himself as uh, a, a politician that helped people. He had helped to feed starving people in Belgium earlier uh, in the administration. He was the secretary... Um, I'm trying to think what his job was at this time. Um, I think it was like a secretary of, uh, of commerce. Anyways, um, I think it comes up. Anyways, he's in charge of the food administration, um, which it's jo their job is to have enough food, obviously, to meet the needs of the population. Uh, and that means conserving. Uh, and uh, and trying to limit your uh, consumption, uh, and he does a masterful job with this, especially using propaganda. Anyways, um, they used voluntary compliance for this as well. So you just they just asked people to do what they could. They didn't force them or require them to. They didn't ration necessary goods and say you only get this many. You could get as much as you wanted, uh, but there was incredible pressure uh, to do everything you could to to support the war effort. Um, famous things are meatless Tuesdays. Uh, we're going to go without meat on Tuesdays because that can be used by the soldiers overseas. Wheatless Wednesdays for the same reasons. So certain days of the week we're going to go without these things. Uh, we're going to make it kind of fun like a tradition in the country that everybody's going to observe. Uh, we're going to allow each people to put pressure on one another, be patriotic. Sign your country's pledge to save food. So hey, save food. Remember... Uh, Lady, uh, Lady Liberty needs you in this incredible time, right? Like an appeal to you, like, please, please, holding under arms. Uh, food is ammunition. Don't waste it, right? Basically arguing, hey, food is another weapon that we have that we can use to win the war. Um, so do your part. Don't waste. 
Uh, food, buy it with thought, cook it with care, use less wheat and meat, buy local food, serve just enough, use what is left, don't waste. Uh, save wheat, meat, fats, and sugars. Why? Well, it tells you what you can replace them with and serve the cause of freedom. Defeat the Kaiser and his U-boats. Victory depends on which fails first, food or frightfulness. Right? So, hey, um, if you want to do your part, right, and to defeat the Kaiser and those U-boats, uh, do your part where you can at home. Save that food. Uh, conserve it. Uh, Congress obviously severely restricted alcohol as one of the key of foodstuffs that we would not have. Uh, this was uh, partly because of progressivism. Uh, it was partly to uh, patriotism to support the war effort. Uh, again, remember this idea uh, or these activities where people voluntarily gave up alcohol leads to prohibition kind of afterwards. We're going to get the 18th Amendment right after the war is over. People's attitude, eh, I did it during the war. I bet I can keep doing it uh, without any negatives. Uh, results of the Food Administration and their efforts. Farm production up by 25%. Uh, so our farms start to produce more. Or I think it's more along the lines of we don't waste as much. We're able to triple our exports of food to the Allies. So we're able to send, um, you know, 300% more uh, food products. Um, and, of course, Hoover's agency starts to get imitated by others. They're going to use the same methods or techniques to try to achieve their things as well. Paying for the war, well, war bonds, called Liberty Bonds, uh, were done. Uh, they were sold in waves across the country that were called bond drives, where there was whips of enthusiasm uh, to do what you could. And one of those things was to give money to the government to help them win the war uh, and to purchase a bond. Uh, so we have parades, we have slogans that are used to promote four different liberty loan drives that occurred throughout the war uh, and one victory loan campaign. So five together. Uh, each drive, um, you know, they would get people out there, they would go door to door, they would have parades, slogans, celebrations, parties, pray, um, picnics, get people out there and, and motivate them to give money. Um, each time they were, they took more money in bonds than they had originally wanted. That's called oversubscription. That can lead to inflation. Um, so they, they received more money than they needed, I guess you could say. Uh, a lot of the times German Americans were especially forced to show their patriotism to their neighbors, uh, and to the authorities to buy these bonds every time. Uh, very famous, you know, and they thought that we couldn't fight. There's an American soldier, right? What's boosting him up with the equipment that he needs? Um, it's our victory loans at home, right? And what has he got in his hands? He's got the helmets of dead German soldiers. Beat back the Hun with Liberty Bonds, right? Look at the evil, monstrous Hun, German soldier. Beat him back. How are we going to do that? Well, you at home can do so with your Liberty Bond. Over the top for you, right? Remember, as they jumped over the trenches into the no man's land, it was called going over the top. That soldier's going over the top for you. How can you repay him? Well, you can do so by buying a U.S. government bond. Halt the Han. What is this German soldier about to do to this innocent woman and child? Who knows? Thankfully, the American soldier is there to stop or halt that Han. How is he there? Well, only thanks to you purchasing your government liberty bond today. Joan of Arc saved at France. Women of America, you need to save your country. You need to be your country's Joan of Arc. How do you do that? Well, you buy war savings stamps. Be Joan of Arc. Be the savior of your country. Give the government the money it needs. Combined, all of these efforts uh, gave got about two-thirds of the way paying for the war. Uh, there were other ways as well that are not really necessary to know. Uh, mostly taxes. Uh, the government did take over the nation's railroads uh, in 1917 because there were problems on the railroads with traffic and delays. Uh, since that was an emergency situation, uh, emergency powers were given to the government where they took over and operated the railroads for efficiency and smoothness. That's kind of socialism. Uh, the government did seize enemy merchant vessels that were in U.S. harbors when we declared war. We refused to give those back. Uh, the biggest contributions the U.S. gave to the war were food, first and foremost, money, secondly, uh, so way up there are food and money, and then men uh, and our actions on the battlefield. So mobilizing the Army, well, uh, in April and May, after we declare, 
Um, European allies uh, were really desperate to get American troops on the battlefield on the Western Front. They claimed that they were running out of troops, that the Western Front was about to collapse. They need us, need us, need us. We're not in a position to fight right away. We instituted a draft in 1917. It's called the Selective Service Act. It required all men age 14 to 45 to register. No exemptions this time. No substitutes unless you worked in a critical war industry. For instance, you were a scientist or something working on war materials. Propaganda. I shouldn't say propaganda. I should say uh, tools used by the U.S. government to get people to join. Well... Uncle Sam, I need you in the Navy this minute. Our country will always be proudest of those who answered the first call. So, you know, volunteer, right? The greatest pride goes to those who sign up first for their country when it's needed. Destroy the mad brute, right? There's the German being depicted again as this horrible brute who's terrorizing the world like King Kong does uh, over uh, New York City. Um, and here's Uncle Sam again. I want you for the Army this time around, right? Join you at your nearest recruiting station. Uh, gee, I wish I were a man. I'd join the Navy. Wow, it's not sexist or anything. Uh, be a man and do it. So here, kind of appealing to uh, your intestinal fortitude here, fellas. Join the Navy uh, like the girl wants you to. I want you for the Navy... Kind of a play on Uncle Sam this time around. That most certainly is not Uncle Sam. Um, but hey, she, she wants you for the Navy too. All right, any more? Oh yeah, over there. Over there was a term we used to describe Europe. So what is Lady Liberty? You notice she's all decked out in her armor. What is she pointing towards? Over there, Europe pointing to the soldier saying that's the direction you need to go. Oh, be a U.S. Marine, right? Kind of playing on the Teddy Roosevelt vibe here, right? Be the next Roosevelt, be the next Rough Rider. Uh, this new fighting force, this rough and tough Marines. Uh, mobilization, very effective. The American Army from 200,000 to 4 million troops during the war. Women were admitted for the first time, about 11,000. Not in any sort of combat role whatsoever, um, there were what we call slacker, what they called slackers, uh, which are people that uh, refused to report uh, for service when they were supposed to. Draft dodgers is what we call them. Uh, there were 4,000 that were excused for various reasons. Uh, 10,000 were prosecuted after the war for dodging. Um, so most of the people who did got away with it. Doughboys was the term they used to describe the American soldier. Um, and I've mentioned to you that it had to do partly, some say, because of their uh, physique, some say because of their uniforms, um, and uh, uh, some say it had to do more with uh, kind of American, I guess you could say, supplies. Uh, that they were constantly kind of eating or giving to Europeans. So anyways, no boys. Uh, was the term that was used to describe American soldiers. Um, in 1917, Germany had sank now a combined 6.5 million tons of shipping, uh, and Russia had withdrawn from the war. Uh, and uh, Germans were moving all of their troops over to the Western Front. That's why they went to war. Uh, that's why they went back to restri unrestricted submarine warfare, uh, because they believed they'd win on the Western Front before the United States could get involved. They were wrong. Of course, remember World War II, the war with all the crazy new technology along with the trench warfare, the machine guns, the poison gas, the new powerful artillery, airplanes for the first time. Uh, all of these uh, are really revolutionary. Uh, you do need to know, let me make sure actually on this one. You don't need this. We can skip over these two and get right into the Western Front. And hey, I'm not going to lie. I'm going to absolutely fly over this because, quite frankly, you need to know virtually none of it. Uh, you need to know the highlighted or darkened or bolded ones. Um, and a couple of general thoughts I'm going to give you. So again, uh, Germany's now all on the Western Front. By the time we get there, we're coming at the nick of time. The other allies are barely holding on. Uh, our army that comes over is known as the American Expeditionary Force, the AEF. 
It is soldiers that are led by John Pershing. Remember, he was the guy that chased Pancho Villa into Mexico. Um, originally, we were replacements for French and British troops that had been destroyed uh, over time. Um, when we joined, Germany was on the verge of conquering Paris. We helped to push them back. Um, of course, um, we... Uh, kind of turned the tide, I think you could say. We joined at the perfect time. Uh, Germany is exhausted along with the rest of Europe. We're kind of fresh. Uh, we're helped to start to push them back across France, back towards Germany. Um, and, of course, uh, American troops fight with distinction. Uh, here you have American forces that are fighting. Look at the destroyed environment. Look at that environment they're fighting in. It looks like, like uh, you know, like a horror scene or something like that. Um, but that's, uh, that's what those weapons and that type of warfare had done. Uh, anyways, um, by 1918, the summer of 1918, Germany's wiped out. Uh, they've suffered desertions from, uh, of their allies. Um, they've had food shortages. Uh, the allies have basically uh, wiped them out just almost, you know, some of the allied countries were just about as wiped out, just a little bit better than Germany. Um, and uh, there were uprisings in the country. Um, and, uh, and so Germany was forced to surrender. The Kaiser, the man that was in charge, the man that had helped push the U.S. into the war and really had helped start the war, um, was forced to step down. That's called abdicating. Uh, Germany laid down her arms, which means surrendered. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and now then, altogether, what are we doing? Uh, Germany is hanging from a noose here. Um, and uh, the Kaiser's hanging from a noose. And he's the only thing that's preventing him from being hanged is standing on the world, and we're pushing the world along with the rest of the countries of the world. We're pushing the world out from underneath him, uh, which means he is going to hang by the rope of greedy ambition. That is kind of an ominous slide. Um, kind of dig it. So, um, highlights of the war, or lowlights in this instance. African Americans were segregated during the war. Uh, originally, a lot of African Americans were unsure whether to join it. Uh, later on, a lot of the leaders, like the boys, urged them to do so, to show what they could do as soldiers to help win equality back at home. Most blacks simply did labor duty. However, um, some fought in action, although it was few and very far between. Uh, for the most part, African Americans uh, were excluded from the war. Uh, and uh, during the war, during the victory parades after the war, 400,000 black troops were excluded. The American government refused to allow them to march. Uh, there was a very famous saying uh, amongst African-American soldiers, they were treated much better in Europe by Europeans than back home by Americans. So they're over there fighting a war for the United States, um, but they're being treated with a great deal more respect uh, by the Europeans. Um, than they had been by whites back in the United States. Casualties. The Americans lost 112,000 soldiers, about 50,000 in battle. Um, overall, 10 million troops died. So we lost about 100,000. Overall, 10 million died. 20 million casualties, almost all in Russia. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's pretty evenly spread out. Um, but uh, if you look at U.S. casualties, where are they? Okay, this is a casualty of all of our conflicts, the number of lives that have been lost. Uh, World War I is the pink little pie here. Um, where's my... There it is. Pink little pie right there. Um, so nothing like World War II or the Civil War that had come before it. Then again, we only fought for about a year in it, uh, as opposed to these, which we fought for much longer. Uh, after the war, well... Wilson is going to lose Congress at a time when he needs them. Uh, so let's get through how this happens. Okay. Uh, he was incredibly popular after the war, especially overseas. But even with the American people, why not? He had just helped to win the war, and the U.S. was getting a ton of the credit. Um, however, there were signs of problems for Wilson back at home. First off, in 1918's congressional elections, Republicans won. Uh, they won a bunch of their seats. Um, and, uh, and Wilson had actually campaigned against some of those Republicans, which was kind of a no-no. Uh, it was an, un it was a rule that they had agreed they wouldn't do. Uh, and he goes out and he does it and then they lost anyways. And so a lot of bitter Republicans that didn't want to work with him after he had kind of gone back on this promise he had made to not campaign against them. 
Uh, also, um, so he's coming back. He's going to go to Europe. Uh, and when he comes back to the United States, one, he's already a little bit diminished in his popularity. But when he comes back, uh, it's going to be even worse for him. Um, and he, the real problem for him is that when he does leave for, for Paris to negotiate the peace deal, uh, he can bring over a group of, of Americans with him, politicians. He chooses all Democrats. The tradition is you choose people from both parties to go with you. He doesn't, uh, and he infuriates Republicans, many of who, again, vow, hey, I am not going to work with this guy. He's straight up disrespecting us. Um, anyways, the Versailles Treaty. Uh, or first off, the Versailles Conference. So it's all the allies meet. Um, the big four are the United States with Wilson, and there he is on the right. Uh, then you have the Brit, David Lloyd George. Uh, you have Vittorio Orlando, the Italian. You have George Clemens, who the Frenchy. And then you have Wilson. Um, here's the problem for Wilson, is these guys don't really agree with the 14 points. They don't agree with a lot of those ideas, and so they weren't willing to sign them. And hey, guess what? In order for the treaty to get done... You're going to need to get all these countries to agree to it. So Wilson's going to struggle to get his 14 points enacted. Now, his goal more than anything was the 14th point, the League of Nations. Um, he had to give up others in order to get it. He had to give up, hey, we, we're going to give up our colonies. Um, we're going to allow colonies to have their freedom. He had to give that promise up. That was one of his 14 points. Um, instead, um, he's able to get the League of Nations. Uh, it's a league covenant, which is like a charter, a constitution that says we're going to establish the league. What's the goal? Collective security. So strength in numbers uh, by working together. Uh, we are going to prevent ourselves from um, coming into conflict with, with one another. And if conflicts do break out, we're going to work together to stop them uh, before they break out. Or if they do, uh, to minimize them, to end them as quickly as possible and to get us back to a state of peace again. Um, Article 10 of the Versailles Treaty was the League uh, Charter uh, that established it. Speaking of that treaty, what are the highlights of it? Well, obviously Germany is and Austria are crushed by it. The big one was the Article 231, the War Guilt Phase, uh, the War Guilt Clause. Uh, it blamed Germany for the war. We know that's not true. We know Serbia and Austria and these other countries were involved. We know there were a lot of factors uh, but ultimately, Germany is given the sole blame in the treaty. They're ordered to pay absurdly high payments or war reparations to the victorious allies to help them pay for the incredible costs of the war. Germany also had to basically accept that their military would be eliminated or reduced to a tiny defensive force. Germany lost a bunch of territory, as did Austria and other countries. Uh, Wilson was able to achieve some of his other 14 points in addition to the league. He was able to get self-determination for many Europeans, which meant we're going to create new countries on the map of Europe. How do we do it? We take away territory from Germany, Austria, and their supporters. So we create Poland and Czechoslovakia and Finland, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. We have all these new countries that are created. Um, which is great because these people are going to have their own independent country and their own voice, but it's also a negative because we don't do enough to protect them and they all become targets of Germany and Russia, the Soviet Union, uh, as we move to World War II. So look at all that territory and land that was taken from Germany in order to create um, uh, these new countries. Also, Alsace-Lorraine, uh, the, the fertile area in, Fran in Germany, is taken and given to France. The Saar region was run by the Allies, which makes a lot of coal and iron. Uh, Belgium got territory. So again, Denmark got territory. Again, all this stuff is taken from uh, Germany um, because, of course, they received the primary blame for the war. Uh, here's the thing. We get back home. Uh, when I say we, I mean Wilson. Uh, and he's stunned to find out, hey, he's not so popular. The, Re the Republicans have been hammering him a little bit. Uh, while he's been away in Europe negotiating, they've been using the media and the press to oppose him. Uh, and there's a lot of opposition to his treaty when he gets home. The Republicans, led by Henry Cabot Lodge, famous senator, had been around forever. Uh, they threatened to kill the treaty if Wilson didn't include additions that guaranteed uh, that we would still enforce the Monroe Doctrine and that we could withdraw from the League if we wanted. Now, here's why. Think about this. Uh, we're worried that the rest of the world could tell us, hey, he got to get rid of the Monroe Doctrine, even though we didn't want to. Uh, and if they voted it, again, and we only had one vote in the League, and everybody voted against us, we would have to get rid of the Monroe Doctrine, which Republicans didn't want to do. 
In addition, we wanted the option to leave. Republicans wanted the option to leave the league uh, if they thought we needed to. Uh, Wilson said that no, you can't have that, right? If we allow them, if we if we you know allow ourselves to leave, it's never going to have the effect that we need where everybody's in there permanently. Uh, so, the, you know, Henry Cabot Lodge leads some Republicans in opposition to the treaty. There were others called irreconcilables uh, who were Republicans who opposed the treaty, period, in any form uh, because they thought it took away our own sovereignty, our own decision making. So there's two groups of Republicans who opposed it, Lodge and the reasonable ones, I guess you could say, and then the irreconcilables who would never sign the treaty no matter what. So this is going to be a battle in Congress, in the Senate, to ratify this treaty. Now, the irony is a majority of the Americans favored it, um, but the Republicans continued to oppose. Uh, And so what Lodge starts to do is he starts to add a bunch of amendments onto the back of the treaty uh, to kind of guarantee American independence and sovereignty in the future, try to guarantee the Monroe Doctrine. Eventually, the treaty gets bogged down, which means it just gets continually negotiated and discussed and discussed and discussed. They're, they don't have enough votes uh, in order to, uh, to, to kind of get it ratified or to defeat it. Wilson eventually goes on a public speaking tour to try to convince the public to pressure the Senate to ratify it. Um, he uh, fiercely defended the treaty, said it couldn't be rat- it couldn't be modified, it couldn't be changed. Uh, he appealed directly to the people on a speaking tour. He was not in good health. He suffered a stroke. Uh, he was basically not able to function as president the rest of his term, and eventually he dies. Uh, during this period, the government's kind of at a standstill. Um, and so here we go, going to talk to the boss. We got Woodrow Wilson racing out the door because the Senate and the House will not cooperate. What's the door? It's the door to the American people. He's going to go to the American people to try to convince them uh, to ratify the treaty. Unfortunately, instead what happens is he ends up passing away. Um, anyways, while all of this is unfolding, um, the Senate under Henry Crabbit Lodge uh, adds 14 amendments to the, Le- to the League of Nations Treaty. Um, and again, they preserved the Monroe Doctrine, they preserved the Constitution, uh, so he's able to get 14 amendments added called the Lodge Reservations. Um, and basically, uh, it took away the United States' power um, to, uh, to, it took away the, the, the League's power over the United States, basically. Um, so even though we're going to be a member of the League if we sign this treaty, uh, we really can, are going to back out of it any chance we get. Um, here we have, um, you know, uh, we have Wilson. He's about to marry foreign entanglements, so foreign wars. So basically saying if we get involved in the treaty, we're going to get ourselves involved in foreign conflicts. So, we're, you know, Wilson's about to marry us to that. The League of Nations is the group that's marrying us. Uh, but at the last minute, the Senate's going to rush in and say, hey, I object. I've got a problem with this. Uh, they're going to interrupt the ceremony. They're going to interrupt the wedding between the United States and Europe. Um, here's, here's an article that's actually a cartoon that's in favor of the treaty. Um, we see the League of Nations carrying, depicted as a dove, carrying, you know, uh, the symbol of peace, the olive branch. And what does the senator see when he sees the peaceful dove? He sees a horrible vulture, a horrible beast, and he's afraid of it. Uh, so this is kind of shaming the, the Senate. Uh, who are objecting to the League, trying to get them to agree to it uh, because this cartoonist thinks the League is a good idea. Here we see the League being depicted as a pilgrim aboard the USS George Washington, um, carrying his lunch pail, W.W. Woodrow Wilson, um, and it's the actual treaty itself trying to get into the United States, but it's being met with all this hostility from the natives, from the Republican hostiles uh, who are trying to kill it. Uh, Wilson uh, rejected all of those amendments. This was while he was still functioning. Um, Democrats voted against the amendments. Uh, So what that meant was the treaty was rejected um, by Democrats and Republicans, even though a majority of them favored a treaty. They just didn't favor that particular one. Ultimately, Wilson argued that the treaty should go to the American people, and if they voted for the Democrats in 1920, that meant they voted for the treaty. If they voted Republican, that meant they didn't want it. All right. 
What are the effects of the war? Well, major effects. Uh, we become the biggest economic power in the world from this point forward. Uh, we become the biggest lender, which means we, uh, we loan more countries' money than ever before. Uh, we become the political leader from this point forward. As a result of the war, the first communist country is created. The Russian Revolution occurs, uh, and the Soviet Union is going to be created. They're going to become a new rival. Britain, France, Austria, and Turkey, the old powers, the old countries that dominated the world, all are going to go into states of decline, where they're going to struggle to hold on to what they once had uh, and to preserve their prestige. Germany's devastated by the war. We know that's going to lead to the rise of Hitler and the start of World War II. Um, in the United States, the war represents an end of progressivism. Uh, we're really going to see progressivism go away. The nation is tired of it after 20 years of progressivism and then the war. I think the nation is looking for less government in their lives and for more prosperity uh, across the board. Uh, the government does return ownership of the railroads to their actual owners in 1920. We're going to experience some race riots uh, at the start of the 1920s, which I believe the next notes talk about. A lot of those had to do with the fact whites coming back from the war as soldiers rioted against African Americans who were in American northern cities now working in many of the jobs the whites previously had had. The worst situation was the Chicago race riot, but there were many others. Election of 1920, Warren Harding is the conservative Republican nominee. Um, he promised a return to normalcy, which means a return to old traditional ways in the country, including old guard conservatism. Democrats nominated James Cox. He was uh, basically ran on support for the league. Uh, his running mate was actually Franklin Roosevelt, uh, but Harding, in a Blowout is able to defeat Cox. Only the Salad South voted for the Democrat. Uh, it was the first time women could vote in an election. Although, to be honest with you, their numbers weren't huge in terms of turnout. Um, it is the end of progressivism because once Harding, the hardcore conservative, wins, he had promised he would eliminate a lot of progressive uh, movements. I guess not eliminate them, but slow them down. Isolationists are able to kill the League as well. Isolationists are able to really end the League. Uh, they're able to prevent another vote on it. Uh, so we never actually ratified the Treaty of Versailles. We signed a separate peace with Germany a couple of years later. We never joined the League, which means the biggest power in the world, the one who uh, needed to be in the League to give it the strength, the power um, to, to be considered or taken seriously, never joined. Um, and uh, we're about to start an incredibly conservative era, an incredibly conservative time, a rejection of progressivism. The pendulum swings back towards conservative Republicans now after 20 to 25 years of very, very progressive government-assisted policies. Uh, what are the two uh, main uh, effects, I guess you could say, uh, for the failure of peace? Well, we're going to get a Great Depression, which is brought on by the treaty. Um, and uh, uh, Europeans really struggle to get over the war and the blame for it. Uh, who's responsible for it? They continue to blame one another, which pushes, it pushes us to another conflict. How did it impact American society, the war? Well, women had a much greater role. That led to suffrage. Prohibition, really, is a direct effect of the war. Um, and uh, we have massive movements of people like African Americans. Uh, we do have a lot more racial and social conflict during, but especially after the war. We see more nativism, anti-German uh, in particular. We did see rights taken away by some American citizens, uh, usually those that oppose the war. Uh, we are going to get a Red Scare after the war, which we'll get to in the next notes. We saw millions of people serve, over 100,000 die. The American public was incredible in terms of their volunteerism and patriotism. We are going to return to isolationism after the war. We would expect that with conservative Republican presidents. We're also about to experience an incredible period of continued economic growth. All right. Um, and, uh, and back to Republican control. Revolted Republicans voted no, making Wilson's European peace crumble miserably. That's a really good memory device uh, for uh, that's actually applicable to the topic. Mr. M signing out on World War One. Try to get this up and going to you right away.